All right, good morning. morning. Greetings to you in the name of the Lord. It's great to see you all here on this fourth Sunday in Advent. I want to welcome those of you who may be here for the first time or who are visiting with us. We're glad to have you. And uh, if you all would join with the entire congregation in filling out the attendance register name, address, phone number, email address, that would be great. And we'll be in touch with you this week. I also want to welcome those who are joining us via the internet on YouTube and Facebook. Thank you for being with us uh, that way. And hopefully you can be with us in person before very long. Uh, A word, I mentioned it's the fourth Sunday in Advent, a word about the, um, about the, uh, uh, church calendar and what's coming up. Uh, This is the fourth season in, or the fourth Sunday in the season of preparation for Christmas. As far as the culture is concerned, this is Christmas, it's not. Uh, We celebrate the birth of our savior next Saturday and we will proceed it with, um, with a Christmas Eve candlelight service, which we traditionally did right up until last year. Last year messed up a whole bunch of stuff, but we are doing that. This year, it will be at seven o'clock here in the sanctuary, and it's a great opportunity to invite friends, uh, family, uh, unchurched folks that you know, um, no restrictions, and we will be glad to see anyone who can join us. Christmas then is on Saturday. The the day after Christmas is uh, traditionally celebrated as St. Stephen's Day uh, in uh, the Catholic and Episcopal and Lutheran churches. St. Stephen, uh, the martyr who was was stoned to death. That's recorded in Acts chapter seven. Uh, uh, And that's that's his feast day, but uh, that, is does not have to be the focus of our of our worship. Our uh, our worship that day is uh, is still focused on Christmas. That's the first Sunday in Christmas. Then January second will be actually the second Sunday in Christmas in the season of Christmas. You don't always have two, but this year, uh, just the way the calendar falls, we will. Uh, so that being the case. Um, we'll still be singing Christmas carols after New Year's, and that's not because we don't know what the date is. It's precisely because we do know what the date is. The fact that it's after New Year's is of less consequence than that it's the second Sunday in Christmas. And then uh, January 9th, we will uh, move to Epiphany. So that's what's coming up. As I said, the uh, Christmas Eve service this year, it is on Friday. Uh, before that, this week, se- session meets this evening, remember, gentlemen, at 5. We've changed that from 5.30. Uh, so we're meeting at 5. And then on uh, Tuesday, the Red Cross is uh, doing a blood drive. And that's going to be from 1 to 6 in the Main Street Center. If you're available and would like to uh, would like to give blood. I believe they need an appointment. Uh, let me see. Who's in, who's in charge? You know, Ken. Yeah, Ken's not here. Um, it couldn't hurt to, to give the Red Cross a call and to check with them. It may be that, well, I shouldn't say it may be. They almost certainly will take walk-ins, but they probably prefer appointments uh, if, if you can do that. Uh, also need to mention, please take note of the insert in your bulletin. Uh, those who have given poinsettias in honor or memory of uh, folks are listed there. Thank you very much to everyone who, who did that. And you are welcome to take those after next Sunday's service. Um, if you wanna leave them beyond that, you're welcome to do so. but. But, you're, but you can also take them uh, after the service on the 26th. Um, I should mention before we proceed to the prelude that um, 
uh, the uh, medley that Linda is playing uh, is one that she invites you to join in singing if, if you care to. Uh, I believe there'll be familiar tunes, uh, things like, um, like uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and uh, Santa Claus is Coming to Town, right? So stuff that you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you'll recognize the tunes, obviously. Feel free, feel free to sing along with her.
we light these candles as a sign of the coming light of Christ. The glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Good morning. Please stand with me for the call to worship. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim and shine forth. Restore us, O God, let your face shine that we may be saved. But let your hand be on the man of your right hand, the son of man who you have made strong for yourself. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we have come here today to call on your name, to worship you, to honor you, to glorify you. God, in our, in our worship, in our fellowship today, God, we just pray that you would be honored above all things. God, we thank you for sending your son Jesus to redeem us from the curse. God, that he has brought to us salvation, that you would stir us up, that you would look down and shine your face upon us today. God, that you would bless us with your presence, and we ask that in Christ's name. Amen. Please join us this morning for our opening hymn, number 104, It Came Upon the Midnight Clear. It came upon the midnight clear that glorious song of old from angels bending near the earth to touch their harps of gold. He saw. i 
come to lead us in prayer, and we hope that you'll bring this in your guidance as, as I lead us. I want to do a simple prayer for my, myself, and uh, uh, the statement that was made in Matthew, no, Matthew, in Daniel, chapter 9, verse 18, where he said, we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. And isn't it wonderful that we have a God that is so merciful? Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we come today, Lord, we are thankful. We're thankful for the blessings that you bring into our lives. And Lord, we are to also be thankful for those difficult times as well uh, that come upon each of us. Lord, we praise your name. We lift you up and recognize that our life, it cannot be full unless we have you as a real part of it. Lord, we come to you at this time realizing that each of us here have our own personal needs and that many that are maybe listening uh, by means of the internet, uh, they too have some issues that they need to lay before you and to claim your promise. Lord, I pray that you will meet the needs that we may have, whether they're emotional, physical, whether they're dealing with sorrow or loneliness, uh, Lord, that we can realize that through all things in our life, that you're there with us and walking with us. And your presence is there if we only can take the time to realize that you are there with us. And Lord, as, as we come to this time of Christmas, this is sometimes a very difficult time for those who have lost loved ones. And we have many, Lord, in our congregation that have lost loved ones this year. Lord, we pray that you will make your presence even known more fully to them as they deal with the loss of that loved one at this special time of year. It's difficult every day, but it seems that holidays are even more difficult. But I ask, Lord, and pray that you will enable each of those individuals that have lost a loved one this year just to feel you in such a way that they are just thankful that you are in their life and that they can get through this difficult period. Lord, be with our church and its needs. Uh, we pray for growth, both physically and emotionally. Uh, uh, we, well, for, we pray for our church in growth in terms of number as well as in terms of our, the spirit that's within, uh, that needs to be within our body. Help us to be able to show love to one another, that we can encourage those that we meet that are not attending somewhere else, that they may want to come and be a part of a fellowship that is a loving fellowship. Lord, guide our thoughts, guide our, our, our direction as a church, and Lord, we just pray that uh, we will see within our ministries and within our groups that uh, study groups or journey groups that your, your word is being taught and preached. Be with everything and all that is done within our church that it will be recognized that it is of your will. And as we continue to pray, we pray the prayer that the Lord taught his disciples saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
are, we are an indebted people. We are forever in the debt of our Lord who saw us in our helplessness and our hopelessness and sent his son that all, that all might change. We have an opportunity to say thank you now for what he has done in each of our lives, in the life of this congregation, in the life of the world. And we would do so with the presentation of our tithes and offerings. morning. Today's Old Testament reading comes from the book of Micah, chapter 5, verses 2 through 5. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. When the Assyrian comes into our land and treads in our palaces, then we will raise against him seven shepherds and eight princes of men. This is God's word. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice. 
voice, Emmanuel, shall come to thee, O Israel. O come thou rod of Jesse free, thine own from Satan's tyranny. From depths of hell thy people save, and give them victory o'er the grave. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. O come thou day spring, come and cheer our spirits by thine advent here and drive away the shades of night and pierce the clouds and bring us light rejoice rejoice Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. O come thou key of David, come and open wide our heavenly home. Make safe the way that leads on high and close the path to misery. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee O Israel, O come desire of nations, bind all peoples in one heart and mind, bid envy, strife, and quarrel cease. Fill all the world with heaven's peace. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Mandy. Uh, she was actually going to do that the first Sunday and then didn't because we were singing it as a congregation, but I wanted her to, uh, I wanted her to, to do that for you all because while what we normally think of when we hear that, that, uh, that song is a congregational uh, singing, congregational congregation singing, uh, the way she sang it, a cappella, is the way it was sung for hundreds of years, uh, particularly in monasteries. It's a haunting tune. Thank you very much for that. And now, please stand for the reading of the gospel, which comes to us this morning from the gospel according to Luke, chapter 1, verses 39 through 45. In those days, Mary rose, arose and went with haste 
into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord oh, should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. The word of God minus one clause that I forgot to read. When Elizabeth heard... The greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. Surely there was life there. We have developed here in America an addiction to the great, the huge, the spectacular. Every February, what is played? Not the NFL championship, the Super Bowl. What's the championship of, of American baseball called? The World Series, to which the Japanese say, really? Come on. The best attended movies are not small stories about ordinary people, they're science fiction and fantasy epics, special effects laden blockbusters that cost $200 million to make. The history that we write is not about the man on the street or the mass of humanity, it's about world changers, captains of industry, generals, presidents. The churches that attract attention are not the ones that quietly spread the gospel and feed the hungry. They're the ones that have 10,000 people in attendance on a weekend, have laser light shows and smoke machines and Christmas shows that cover acres, involve dozens of live animals and attract thousands of attenders. The architect who gets noticed doesn't design functional three bedroom homes for middle-class people. Rather, they, uh, they design $3 million mansions for corporate executives. The point is that regardless of whether we're talking about sports or entertainment, uh, whether we're talking about uh, politics or business or religion, we want it big, we want it splashy, we want it breathtaking, we want it spectacular. Now, What's truly amazing about the God who became incarnate in Jesus Christ is that despite the fact that he's the most awe-inspiring, magnificent being in the universe, the creator of everything, he apparently prefers the simple, the quiet, the ordinary, the lowly, the small. For the God of our salvation, it's the little things that are most important in this world. That was the message that his prophet, Micah, when called upon to speak of the Messiah's coming, gave. So said the Messiah's mother when she praised God for what he did in and through her. Micah, in the fifth chapter of the book that bears his name, prophesied that the Messiah would come from Bethlehem of Judah, the smallest of the small. But you, O Bethlehem Ephratah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, the clans all had their own identity. They were 
family groupings, uh, actually considerably larger than family groupings within the territories of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin and Levi, which were the only tribes that were still in existence in Israel, the other 10 having been taken away by the Assyrians. Um, Bethlehem doesn't even have that. It's simply a little backward town, five miles southeast of Jerusalem, that nobody pays any attention to. Now, Micah doesn't tell us why God chose this particular place to come into the world. However, it does keep very much in, in tune with, uh, with God's modus operandi, method of operation to that point in history. Think back. Abraham, the man chosen to be the father of a great nation, wasn't a king, he wasn't a general, he wasn't a great philosopher, he wasn't a, uh, he wasn't a, 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 a huge farmer, he was simply an ordinary man who didn't know God. And yet the nation that was to come to, from him was called great, a nation through which the entire world would be blessed. It would be as if God, for reasons unknown and contrary to all conceivable wisdom, had, had come to Gus and said, I'm going to make a great people out of you, to which we would have all said, huh? To which Gus would say, huh? And to which Abraham, no doubt, said, huh? The funny thing is that the nation that came from Abraham was not great in the way that the world counts greatness. It wasn't wealthy. It wasn't powerful. It wasn't huge in population or territory. Even at its largest, the territory controlled by the, by the people of Abraham was... Uh, dwarfed by any of the great empires of the time. It was great only in the sense of having a great mission to do in the world solely by God's grace, solely by his choice, a choice that did not take worldly factors into account, but rather were his own. The exodus of the people of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was not on behalf of some important or powerful nation that needed to be saved. Uh, it was on behalf of a bunch of slaves. God didn't look at them and say, you know, they're, they're not worth the effort. I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to go to Babylonia. I'm going to go to Assyria. I'm going to go to Persia. Surely there must be a people worth saving somewhere from something. No, he, he looked at the nation of slaves and he said, they're the ones. They're the ones. On an individual level, the same thing uh, operates in God's revelation to Elijah. You'll remember he had been driven away uh, out into the desert, the Judean wilderness, south of Jerusalem after his confrontation with the 400 prophets of Baal, those 400 prophets were destroyed. And the result was that Jezebel, the real ruler of Israel at that point, uh, a Canaanite idolater, uh, sought his life and he fled into the wilderness. And there in the wilderness, what came to him? An earthquake. God wasn't in the earthquake. Fire from heaven. God was not in the fire. A great rushing wind. God was not in that either. God was in a still, small voice, heard or seen by no one else but the man for whom it was intended. 
When God told Micah that he, God, would come into the world in a backwater town in the middle of nowhere, rather than say Rome or Athens or Alexandria in Egypt, any of the great cities of the world at that time, when he said that he would basically come from Jonesboro, he was saying, he was pointing to the fact that what is small or unimportant in the eyes of the world becomes great by its association with the purposes of God. Something that can be said about every single person here. As I look across this congregation, I do not see a single person that the world as a whole would miss if you died tomorrow. And of course, I'm included in that, as are uh, Mary Ann downstairs, and uh, I think Kate uh, Cohen is down there. Uh, if any of our, if any of our security folks are wandering the building, yo, you're included in that too. You're of no consequence, as the world counts consequence. Not a single one of us will be missed by the world when we leave it. And that doesn't matter. That doesn't make the slightest bit of difference because we're in the hands of God and we are important enough that he has sent his own son into the world to save us from ourselves. That's how important we are to him. Well, Mary, the mother of Jesus, stands as a prime example of how this works. And quite frankly, while Protestants have a tendency to ignore Mary and to, to, to treat her like she's of no importance, she stands as a wonderful example to every single one of us. Mary, the Blessed Virgin, whose name has probably been known better than that of any other human being who has ever lived with the, with the exception of Jesus himself. Mary, the mother of Jesus was a nobody. She was a person of no importance whatsoever. Oh, but wait a minute, she, she was descended from David. That, that, that makes all the difference. No, it doesn't. <laughs> no, it doesn't, actually. Because Mary was no different in that regard than probably thousands of other people. Yes, it is true that the Messiah was supposed to come from David's line, and therefore it had to be one of them. But no particular reason it had to be this descendant of David. Have, have, I, have I mentioned to you all before that, uh, that my wife uh, is a cousin of George Washington? Yeah, nine times removed, a seventh cousin. That's what you call a significant connection related to the father of our country. Hey, listen, I can't claim that. I can't, I can't even remotely claim that. Does that make her special? Uh, <clears throat> unfortunately not. If, if, if I were to do the, the genealogy of every person here, I suspect the chances are that at least a quarter of you can probably say the same thing. So Mary's being part of the house of David by itself is of no significance except to the extent that she fulfilled the terms of one of the prophecies regarding Jesus, but she's not the only one who could have done that. She's, not, she's also not of any great means, and we know that because she marries a carpenter. This is not a highborn woman. Uh, this is not a woman who people sought out 
and who, who desperately wanted her because she would have a great dowry when she got married. No, she took the husband she could find. And then she had the added burden of being pregnant out of wedlock, which may or may not be a big deal today. In those days, however, that made her an outcast and just emphasized her, her insignificance. And perhaps in some ways, the worst thing for Mary was that she was female. And that meant that she was totally dependent. Women didn't generally have the opportunity to fend for themselves. Uh, and when Joseph was confronted with her pregnancy, if he had done what everyone undoubtedly told him to do, anyone who expressed an opinion, which was to put her away quietly, as Matthew says, uh, she would have been left with nothing. She'd have been left destitute with a baby on the way and no means of supporting herself. To allow God to be conceived within her under those circumstances could only be called an act of total trust that he would take care of her. In fact, it wouldn't have been too surprising if she'd said to God the same thing that Gus did. Huh? You have got to be kidding. This is the stupidest idea I have ever heard. You know, you remember Moses' response when God called him to be his spokesman before Pharaoh. He argued with him. He gave him five different reasons why he thought it was a bad idea. So it's not as if that's unprecedented. Mary could well have said, you know, when I look at the totality of my circumstances, I can't help but think that you must despise me to ask me to do something like this. She could. She could have said that. But of course, that was not her response. Her response encapsulated in the passage called the Magnificat, because the first word in Latin is, uh, is that. Um, she says, my soul magnifies the Lord and my God, my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. He has done great things for me. He has picked me out of a mass of humanity, risen me, raised me up, and given me the honor of having a child out of wedlock, such that my husband could divorce me before our marriage even begins, and left me begging in the streets. He's done great things for me. But of course, she recognized there's far more, there's far more to, to life than, uh, than material sustenance. It's important. I'm not, not suggesting it's not. But Mary recognized there is something far more important than that. He who is mighty has done great things for me. He has chosen me to carry out the most important mission that any mere human being has ever been asked to carry out. He has asked me to be the channel through which, through whom the world would receive its savior. And he didn't care that I was nobody. I'm not a king's daughter. I'm not a priest's daughter. I'm not, I'm not from the household of an emperor. I'm a peasant girl living in the middle of nowhere. My goodness, the only place I can think of that would be more, more out, of the, out of the way of anything is Southern Illinois. 
And yet he has chosen me, even as he has chosen each of us, not to carry the savior of the world, not physically, but rather to carry the savior of the world to a world in desperate need of knowing who he is. He's chosen us for that. And in that regard, he has done nothing more than continue the practice that he started long before Christ and that he has continued long after Christ. People, even people whom we think of as historically significant, great saints of the faith were in fact, for the most part, nobody. They weren't popes, they weren't bishops, they weren't great preachers. Francis of Assisi, who is often held up as the, the single Christian who has most closely lived the life of Christ in this world, gave up great wealth and noble title in medieval Italy in order to become a wandering beggar a wandering beggar who, among other things, <laughs> sought to convert the Sultan of Muslims to Christianity. Such was his holiness that the Sultan was willing to hear him and to give him safe passage and to respectfully consider what he had to say. Could could anyone else, could any, could, could any king, could the Pope in those days have done that? No, certainly not. But a wandering beggar could. Therese of Lisieux, who I've talked about at some length a couple of summers ago when I preached through 1 John, a nun who never, with one exception, never left the area of her birth, who lived the last nine of her 24 years in a cloister hidden away from the world and who died a terrible, painful death from tuberculosis in complete and utter obscurity in the last six months of her life dictated to her sister the story of her life a story that has then, since her death, been used to influence tens of millions of people. It's one of the 10 best-selling books of the 20th century, her autobiography is. A person who in 1897, when she died, no one outside of her family and her fellow nuns and a handful of Roman officials had ever heard of. Forty-four years ago, another nobody was used by God, not in any great or, 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 uh, or stupendous way, certainly not in a way that anybody else noticed. It wasn't done through a multimedia presentation of the gospel, but God used Marianne with one simple sentence to change my life. One sentence has brought me to where I am now. I don't know how you all feel about that, but. I'm blessed, I've been blessed for 44 years now because somebody I barely knew said something that grabbed hold of me like nothing ever has. The truth is that God can and wants to use every one of us 
the world isn't going to know us the way that it knows the Blessed Virgin Mary or the way that it knows Francis of Assisi or the way that it knows Therese of Lisieux, the way it knows Billy Graham, the way that it, it, it knew Martin Luther. The world's not going to know us that way, you and I. But that doesn't mean that great things cannot be accomplished. They can, and they will be, even if only simply in our own homes. And the reason is the same reason why God came into the world at Bethlehem. Because the rich and the powerful They've got the world, the little, the poor, the insignificant, the unknown. God's got them. And that is all they need. Let's pray. <sighs> Father, we thank you that in your incalculable wisdom, you have decided to use us, insignificant people from an insignificant little town in a small church in the middle of nowhere, but you've decided to use us to change lives and who knows to even change the world. Father, we thank you for the grace that you've given us to carry out that mission. And our prayer is that you will give us to the strength and the wisdom that would enable us to be faithful to the call that you've given to each of us. For we ask it in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Please stand as you're able for our closing hymn, number 107, Gentle Mary Laid Her Child. And now as you depart, receive this benediction.
from the Lord, may the God of all grace, who has used even the lowly and the humble to carry out his purposes and call each of us to go into the world with his good news. Be with us, doing his work in us, and pray for us.